Good afternoon. My name is Richard Snyder. I'm the biometeorology specialist at UC Davis, and I work with Cooperative Extension over the state of California. And today I'm going to talk to you about evapotranspiration-based scheduling during a drought. To start with, uh, when you do water balance irrigation scheduling, what you're doing is trying to keep track of how much water there is in the soil at any given time. And when you deplete enough water, then you want to irrigate and bring it back up to fill it back up to field capacity again. So this equation is the common equation that's used for water balance. It shows delta W, which is the change in the water content. And that's going to be equal to the sum of the irrigation applications, any precipitation, which includes rain, fog, and dew. Uh, capillary movement of water, if you have a water table, you can have water move up into the root zone, and that can provide water for evapotranspiration. Um, and then you have to subtract off any water that's lost from the field, like runoff, any deep percolation below the root zone, and you also subtract off the evapotranspiration, actually evapotranspiration in this case. And normally, if you're doing a good job of irrigation, the, the ETA, the evapotranspiration of the crop, uh, tends to be the main part of the water balance. So most of the change in the water content is due to evapotranspiration. So this is kind of a diagram showing how the evapotranspiration of the water balance works. You have irrigation where you put water onto a field that water can move across the field. It's going to percolate down into the soil. Some of it could run off the end of the field. Um, you could have water that seeps out the bottom that goes out as deep percolation. You can have a water table, which maybe the water moves back up into the root zone, provides water for the crop to uh, transpire. Um, again, you could have runoff, and you can have precipitation, which includes rainfall, fog, and dew. All those things can contribute water to the crop, and then of course you lose most of the, of the water to evapotranspiration. But in water balance scheduling, what we're trying to do to, is keep track of the storage of water in the root reservoir, and then when, again, when we get to a certain level, if we deplete enough water, then we know we want to irrigate, we know how much we have to apply to bring it back up to field capacity again. Um, I mentioned about uh, different things that are important. Rainfall, of course, is one of the important factors in water balance scheduling. Of course, rainfall falls on the field. It's usually relatively uniform, um, but what we're really concerned about is effective rainfall because if the rainfall falls really fast, you can have some of it run off the field as runoff. You could have some, if you have enough water, you can actually have deep percolation and lose water out the bottom of the root zone. So one of the things you have to do is you have to calculate or estimate what the effective rainfall is. Of course, in a drought, you don't usually have too much rainfall, but it does happen occasionally, and so it is a factor you have to consider. Another thing that's often overlooked in California, and it's quite important, is fog contributions to the water balance, especially along the coast in the Central Valley in the winter. Um, some of the mountain valleys, you'll get fog and you get dew, and that gets the plants wet. Well, the thing that determines what the evapotranspiration is is how much energy there is to vaporize the water and send it off into the air. And so if you have wet plants and the water comes out of the air, it's contributing to evapotranspiration, but it's not coming out of the soil. So you have a tendency to overestimate how much water is coming out of the soil, and that gets your water balance calculations off. So this graph can be used to give you an idea of what the fog contribution is. For example here, this is a curve that shows the normalized ET, reference ET, versus the local standard time of the day. So for example, if your plants are wet when you get up in the morning and it doesn't dry off until about 11 o'clock in the morning, if you come up to this curve and you go over to the left, what this is saying is about roughly about 30% of the ET on that day is coming from the fog or the dew and it's not coming from the, from the ground. So if you're in a foggy coastal area, this is one way that you can estimate how much is coming from the fog and the dew or even light rainfall if you don't record it. Another factor, another thing you have to be concerned about is water tables. Um, the ET is usually about the same whether you have a water table or don't have a water table. The difference is when you have ET without a water table, the ETC in this case, you're losing evapotranspiration, but there's no water coming in from below coming up into the root zone. If you have a water table like the one on the right, you can see that there is some uh, water coming back up from the water table back up into the root zone. So the ET is the same, but the change in the soil water, stored soil water content in the root zone is going to be very different. And so if you have a water table, usually you're going to have trouble using ET-based irrigation scheduling. Uh, 
Um, so ET, in ET-based scheduling, what you need to do, generally you need to have a well-drained soil because it's very difficult to estimate how much water is coming from a water table. So usually we apply it to well-drained soils. If you have a water table, it's probably better to do some kind of a soil-based measurement. Um, you have to account for rainfall, dew, and fog, as I talked about already, um, because it will have an effect on the water balance. You have to account for runoff. If you have surface irrigation, you'll have runoff off your field. You may use that water on the next field, but for that particular field that you're dealing with, you have to subtract that off um, to look at how much water actually is applied to the field. You have to know the application rate. Regardless of how you do irrigation scheduling, the application rate, you have to know what that is in order to do a good job of irrigation. You also have to know how you have to optimize the distribution uniformity. And what the distribution uniformity is, it's a measure of how equally water soaks in across the field. So the first thing you do is subtract off the runoff. The rest of the water is going to soak into the field. And then because it's not evenly distributed, some of that water is going to go into deep percolation below the root zone. Some of it's going to get stored in the root zone. And so if you know the distribution uniformity, it helps you to figure out how much water to apply. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. And one of the key things is you have to have an accurate estimate of ET. And so I'm going to talk about the ET next. Well, first I'll talk about irrigation efficiency and distribution uniformity. Um, application efficiency, or AE, like we see in this slide, is the percentage of applied water that contributes to ET. So when you apply water to the field, you want to subtract off any of the losses, any of that water that doesn't get stored in the field. So if you have runoff, you would subtract that off, or if you have deep percolation, you would subtract that off. But anything that wets the plants or gets stored in the root zone would contribute to the, to the uh, evapotranspiration of the crop, and so it's considered efficient. So the application efficiency is the is the ratio of the water that's stored in the root zone or on the surface that can contribute to evapotranspiration divided by the amount that you apply. Uh, the distribution uniformity is, um, again, it's a measure of how equally water soaks in across the field. And so the way it's calculated is you have to calculate the mean low quarter depth infiltrated divided by the overall mean depth infiltrated. So you have to do a system evaluation to figure out what your distribution uniformity is. And there are methods to do that for drip irrigation, micro-sprinklers, sprinklers, and even surface irrigation. But you, what you're trying to do is you want to measure the amount of water that goes into the fourth of the field that receives the least amount of water. You divide by the overall mean, and that's a measure of how equally the water is soaking in across the field. And we use that for scheduling. And you, use this, you have to use this method whether you're doing, using soil-based measurements or using ET or whatever method you have, you still have to use the distribution uniformity to figure out how much water to apply. So, uh, to get the irrigation runtime, the way you do it is you have to have the infiltrated water. So that's the soil water depletion, so that's the ET, basically. You figure out how much water has been depleted from the soil root reservoir, the part where the roots are, and you divide that by the distribution uniformity, which is a, you get by doing a system evaluation. So the soil water depletion divided by the distribution uniformity tells how much water you need to infiltrate into the soil. Now, the amount that you actually apply is the gross application, and that's equal to the infiltrated water plus the runoff. So if you want to figure out infiltrated water, you, you figure out how much water do I apply, and then you have to subtract off the runoff to get the infiltrated water. The runtime is equal to the gross application divided by the application rate. So if we want to figure out how many hours to run, we figure out, well, how many inches of water do I have to apply in order to get a good distribution uniformity and get the right amount of water applied back into the field. And I have to divide by the application rate to figure out what the runtime is. So what we're going to talk about now is how do we get the soil water depletion? And it's actually equal to the cumulative evapotranspiration. So we're going to talk about how to get the cumulative evap evapotranspiration next. So the process to get the evapotranspiration of a crop is uh, actually a three-step process. The first thing we do is we estimate reference evapotranspiration, or ETO. And what that is, it's a measure of the evaporative demand. Um, so it's characterizing the weather and because the weather is going to affect what the evapotranspiration rate is of different crops. And so it actually estimates, ETO is an estimate of the evapotranspiration from an irrigated pasture. And so then what we do is we relate that ET of the irrigated pasture to the evapotranspiration of various crops, and that tells us how much water we need to apply to a crop. So for example, the second step, if you take 
the ET of the crop, ETC, for a well water crop is equal to ETO times a crop coefficient. Now, often you'll hear people talking about crop coefficients, and the key is that the crop coefficient is, is an estimate of the ET of the crop divided by reference ET, the ETO, uh, for a well watered crop. So we're assuming it's not water stressed, or there's no salinity stress, or any, any disease problem, or anything like that. The third step is if you have water stress, so that would be the bottom one down here, and that's when we get ETA, which is the actual ET, and that's equal to the well watered ET, the ETC, multiplied by a, crop co uh, by a stress coefficient in this case. Um, these are not very well known because it's very complicated because it involves knowing how deep the roots are, how extensive the root system is, the soil properties and everything. So it's a little difficult to get those values for the stress coefficient, but you can estimate them in some cases. Generally in California, we usually don't have to deal with that. In a drought situation, we might have to from time to time. Now, I talked about ETO. Where you get the ETO information, the, the reference evapotranspiration is from CIMIS in California. There's a network of about 150 automated weather, weather stations all tied together with a computer in Sacramento. It calls all these weather stations once a day, collects weather data, hourly weather data, and then it calculates the reference ET the daily reference ET for all those stations, and that information is available the next day on the, on the internet through the CIMIS web, web page. And the, the URL, the, the link to get to the CIMIS web page is right here. Um, if you get into that website, uh, this is the welcome page. You get into the welcome page and it'll ask you, if you haven't been in before, it'll ask you to register. There's no cost for the information. The state provides the ETO information free to anybody who wants it. You do have to register, so you have to give them a, an ID and a password, and they'll ask you, you know, what you do they, and, um, you know, for a living if you're a farmer or a consultant or whatever you happen to be. And, they're, um, and they just do that because they like to keep track of who's using it. Um, once you have the ETO information, Again, that's the evapotranspiration from an irrigated pasture. The way we get the crop coefficient, the actual crop coefficient, first off we get the KC, which is the evapotranspiration of a well water crop, the ETC, divided by ETO. And we multiply by ETA divided by ETC. If we multiply these two things together, we end up with the actual ET, ETA, divided by ETO. And that's why I call it KA. It's an actual coefficient. The crop coefficient is this part right here, and the stress coefficient is right there. And so normally we only have to deal with this. Normally we'll have just a KC value. The way you get that is you measure the evapotranspiration of a crop and we have different methods. We can use lysimeters or we can measure the weather over a crop, micrometeorological measurements, and we can estimate the evapotranspiration of a particular crop and we put it into this equation. We can calculate the KC value if it's well watered. If it's not well watered then we would get this, this value right here, ETA divided by ETO. If we know what this is, then we can calculate what this is too. So we can get the stress factor if we, if we know what the well water should be. Um, so that's the way we, we get the crop coefficients. And uh, again, there are many, many different methods for estimating what that is. A lot of this stuff is tabulated already. I'm going to talk a little bit about where you can get that information, what's available, and give you a few numbers here. First off, once you get the crop coefficient, this is a, a typical crop coefficient curve that you might see for field and row crops. You can see the crop coefficient is over here on this y-axis scale, and then this is the time on this axis. Um, we have it broken down by letters. This is A, a to B is an initial growth period, and then from date B to date C is a rapid growth period. And this is typical of field crops. Uh, from date C to date D is mid-season period, and from date e, D to date E is the late season period. So initial growth is when you plant until you reach about 10% ground cover. Once you have 10% of the ground covered with vegetation, then you usually get a pretty fast growth of the crop. And that's, so the crop coefficient starts to go up quickly as you start to develop more vegetation on the surface. When you get up to about 70% ground cover, up at this position right here, then you get about 70% ground cover, and it's pretty much intercepted most of the light by that time. And so once you've intercepted most of the, the sunlight, there's not a big increase in the crop coefficient anymore. So it tends to level off. And during the mid-season, you tend to have about the same crop coefficient all the time. And then late in the season, you'll start, the plants will start to age, and they'll start to, to die back. And during that 
senescence period, the late season period, you'll see a drop in the general drop in the crop coefficient until you get to the end of the season. So all you have to do, uh, we have some irrigation programs, I'll talk to you about those in a little bit, that you can put in your starting date, you can put in your ending date, and it'll give you estimates of what these other dates are, the B, C, D, and it gives you the crop coefficient during, on date B, gives you the crop coefficient on date C and D, and gives you the crop coefficient on date E, and so it automatically will draw in this curve for you. Um, and you also have the ability to change those numbers if you want to. But the numbers that we have are based on the best research we have at this time. So this is some examples of some of the field crops that we have crop coefficients for. We have more than this, but uh, because of time, I can only show you a few. But for example, let's look at, at the corn right here. So the crop number is 1.13, and so we number them so we know which crop we're, we're working with in this program. You put in the corn grain, for example, I would select corn grain, and then I would have to put in the start date, the date A, and the date E, the end date. And this is, tells me it's 20% of the season from date A to B. It's 45% of the season from date A to C, and it's 75% of the season from date A to, to date D. And of course, it's 100% to date E. And this is the crop coefficient on date B. This is on date C and on date D. Usually they're the same most of the time. There are some crops that they change. And then this is the crop coefficient at the end of the season. And we give some sample starting dates and ending dates. So this is on May 1st and it ends on September 30th. Um, there are a lot of different planting dates, so this is just to give you a, a rough idea. So in the program, you can change what those values are. And so you put in your starting dates and your end dates, or if you don't know, you can put in these as a, as a rough estimate. And you can see the other ones are all very similar. You put in your, your date A and your date E, and everything gets automatically picked out of the program and, and used to generate your, your curve. Um, for deciduous orchard and vine crops, uh, the crop coefficient curve looks more like this. You don't have the initial growth period because in the spring, the leaves just start to leaf out on the trees, and so it starts with rapid growth right away. So we don't have date A to B. We just eliminated the date A to B, the initial growth period. So we start on date B for the, for the tree crops and the orchard, tree and vine crops. Um, so you see a rapid increase in the crop coefficient up to about 70% ground cover. Remember on the field crops it was 75%, but on trees and vines it's 70%, and that's because they're taller and they tend to intercept more of the light um, at a smaller uh, ground cover, ground shading. Um, so about 70% ground cover, you're at date C, and then the mid-season period goes until you reach this, the onset of senescence, which is on date D. Uh, again, it's not easy to know what that is, so we provide that information for you. Uh, in table, so when you run these programs that we have, you put in your starting date, your ending date, and it will automatically calculate what that senescence date is. And then, of course, the, the uh, crop coefficient drops off late in the season until you get down to date E. So this is typical for any of the tree and vine crops, uh, deciduous tree and vine crops. If you have subtropical trees or olives or, or trees that don't lose their leaves all year, usually we figure that the crop coefficient is about the same all the time. Um, there are differences because if, it, if it's in the winter time, for example, in citrus and the plants get wet and stuff, then the evapotranspiration goes up a little bit. So the KCs tend to be higher when it's wet and when the ET, ETO rates are lower. So in the winter time, it usually goes up a bit. Uh, these are some examples of permanent crop growth and coefficient examples. Um, for example, if you look at almonds here, it's uh, crop number 3.01. Uh, starting on date B, they're always zero on date B. And then from B to C, it's 50% uh, of the season from date B to C, and then it's 90% of the season from date B to date D, and then of course it's 100% to date E. And these are the crop coefficients on date B. C and D, they're about the same. Um, this was done a little bit ago. Uh, I think probably the KCs are a little bit higher now. I'd say at least 1.1 they found in recent research, so we might have to raise these a little bit. Uh, we're continually doing work, so we try to update them all the time. And we keep them in a, in a scheduling program that's available from Extension, and I'll tell you the source of that in a little bit. And so we keep updating those, so you might want to check back to see what crop coefficients are, recent, uh, the recent ones. This one I'll have to raise up a little bit. Um, date C, it went down to about 0.65. Again, we have a start date, the month, and the day. So this is March 1st, and then the end date was 
October 15th, uh, just for an example. Now down here you can see we have citrus and I have for greater than 12 feet tall and for less than 10 feet tall. Um, we've done some recent research in the last few years and we find that the taller trees have considerably higher crop coefficients than the shorter trees. Um, they tend to be the same all the time. So dates B, C, D, and E are all about the same crop coefficient. Um, but anyway, so if you had a tree that was say 15 foot tall, if you had an orchard 15 foot tall, which is pretty big trees, you might have a KC of one all the time because it intercepts the light all the time. If you have one that's 10 feet tall, you may have some periods when the light's hitting the ground and so the crop coefficient is lower a bit. And of course in the, the subtropicals, the ones that are permanent all year, you can see that we go from January 1st to December 31st. I mentioned stress before. Um, it takes quite a while to talk about stress. I'll just kind of introduce it here. Um, normally we don't, we try to avoid water stress when we're growing crops, um, especially severe stress that's going to reduce the evapotranspiration um, and that's going to reduce your yield too. So we try to avoid that. But this, this is a curve that's the way that you would figure it out. You have to know what the available water content is in your root zone. So you have to know how deep your roots are you have to know what the available water content is. So that's water that's a, that the plants could potentially take out of the soil. And you have to know what fraction of that you're able to extract before you start to get stressed. Typically, you can, you can take out about 50% of the available water before you start to get water stress. So this is that KS function that I was talking about earlier. If you go from zero depletion, so if you're at field capacity, which is represented by this line right here, this axis, um, the KS value is 1, and it's going to stay at 1 until you get out to some allowable depletion. So I use the symbol AD for allowable depletion. And then it's going to drop off later in the season. Usually it's fairly linear out until you get to 100% depletion of the available water. This curve is a little bit, you know, we're kind of guessing at it because we don't have information on every soil and every crop, but it gives you an idea. Um, the allowable depletion for most crops tends to be about 50% of the available water. If you have a crop that doesn't have a very extensive root system and it's high value, then I would use a value probably more to the left here. So you couldn't deplete quite as much. For example, if you had lettuce, you wouldn't deplete as much water as you would if you had a cotton crop. So for lettuce, you probably have a, a smaller allowable depletion. If you had cotton or alfalfa, you could maybe go out 60, 60, 70%. Um, depletion of the available water before you start to get water stress because they have very extensive root systems. So anyway, you could use this curve to figure out what, it is, what your um, actual evapotranspiration is. In most cases, that's not going to happen. Usually you have mild stress, moderate stress, which will reduce the size of the plants, but it doesn't necessarily close the stomata, which causes the water stress and reduces the transpiration. Okay, this is just an example. This is actual measurements from a high-density clementine uh, citrus orchard uh, we did in 2013, in the summer of 2013. Uh, we set up our experiment in late, well, mid-May approximately. And you can see this red line is representing the cumulative evapotranspiration that we observed. This was down near Dinuba, down in uh, San Joaquin Valley. So you can see how the evapotranspiration increased uh, during the season. And then this is showing the irrigations that were applied. So every time they irrigated, you can see it goes up. Well, I, they were under irrigating a little bit all the time. So at the end of this period when we were measuring, which is most of the, of the main ET season, they were about four inches. They depleted about four inches below um, what the ET was. And so it really makes a difference how deep the root system is as to whether or not that was a problem or not. Most likely it wasn't because I think they got pretty good production out of that. So if you get into a drought situation, what you're going to do is you're probably going to apply about the same frequency, but you'll put on a little bit less water, which means you'll end up the season a little bit later. And that's where you're going to might possibly have some reduction in production because of that. If you have an agronomic crop, a field crop, what you can do is you can reduce the size of the field that you plant and use less water on the field that's, that you planted to, and that can save you some water and keep your production higher. But of course, when you reduce the, the planting size, the area that you plant, you're going to reduce your production too. So there's always this trade-off is, well, I cut back on the size of my field. Um, you know, I, you don't want to waste water. You want to use the water as efficiently as possible. And so the idea is to try and guess or try to estimate where you think your soil water is going to be at the end of the season. And do you have enough water stored in the soil for you to do that? 
and that's the key to working in a drought. So back to the irrigation scheduling again. During a drought, okay, the one thing I can't emphasize enough is you need to know your application rate. And, and you can't necessarily go by what the manufacturer tells you if you have a drip or a sprinkler system or whatever, micro sprinkler. You should go out and do some kind, do an evaluation and find out what the application rate is because you find over time that they get off. Uh, they might have been designed properly, but over time the, the nozzles wear out and you have problems or the pressure changes. And so you really need to check your system carefully when, you have, when you're doing irrigation during a drought. You want to optimize the distribution uniformity. You want to get the more efficient, the more evenly you soak in water across the field, the better off you are, the less water you have to apply to get your production. So you make that distribution uniformity just as high as you possibly can. So it's really important that you get out there and do a system evaluation. You need to have accurate estimates of ET. There are crop coefficients available. We have ETO, standard reference ET, available all over the state of California. It's pretty easy to use the CIMIS, uh, um, CIMIS uh, network to get onto their website and get the information. It's pretty easy to do. Um, I would recommend that very highly. You start looking into that. Uh, when you get ready to figure out how much to apply, what you have to do is take your soil water depletion, which again is the cumulative evapotranspiration. We add up the evapotranspiration on each day. That estimates how much water has been depleted. As long as you have a well-drained soil and you're not getting a lot of water from dew and fog, this will work fine. If you're getting water from dew and fog or from a water table, then you have to make corrections for that. But you take that soil water depletion and you divide it by the distribution uniformity. And when you do that, it forces the application to refill the low quarter back up to field capacity. So that means three-fourths of the field is going to be irrigated more than it needs. So what that says is that you could probably irrigate less and you probably would have some stress, some water stress that might reduce the yield a little bit in one-fourth of the field, but the rest of the field is still going to be okay. And the more you reduce that down, of course, the more of your field is going to be subjected to water stress and could possibly reduce the, the production. That's why the DU is really important. When you make that DU really high, then, then you're going to get a more even um, application of water across the field, and that's going to be beneficial. You're less likely to have losses due to water stress in part of the field. You can practice deficit irrigation if you really don't have enough, if you start running out. Um, you can do deficit irrigation, but I would recommend that you probably keep roughly the same schedule that you do in other years. If you can't do that, then you need to either plant less or, or take some of the crop out of production. But what you should do is try to keep your irrigation frequency about the same and apply less water with each irrigation. So you have less applied water, but you apply it at about the same rate as you do in normal years. And what that does is you'll have more moderate stress, but you probably won't have severe stress, which is stress which is more likely to cause a big yield reduction. So, some of the information that's available, uh, if you go to my website, which is uh, http colon slash slash biomet.ucdavis.edu, I have a scheduling program on there called BIS. There's BIS-M and there's uh, BIS-E and BIS-M. BIS-E is in English units, BIS-M is in metric units. Uh, this BIS.pdf is the documentation that talks about how the program works. There's also an irrigation scheduling concepts uh, document on there, uh, iswbm.docs, and it talks about irrigation scheduling, some of the things I talked about today. Um, but, and also to get the current crop coefficients, we try to keep these up to date. Uh, we're always updating, so if you get on there and it's not working, it's probably because we're changing the crop coefficients, trying to upgrade them. But most of the time, it's available. So uh, again, for English units, you go on and get bis e. Uh, .xlsx, that's a, an Excel program for doing irrigation scheduling, and one of the worksheets in there has the crop coefficients, the latest ones that we're using in California. And that's all I have. Thank you very much.